Okay. Um, hi everyone and welcome to the Cambridge Middle East and North Africa Forums event on Iraq, looking at both Iraqi domestic politics and the repercussions on the region more widely in light of the recent elections. MENEF is a growing think tank based at the University of Cambridge, which is a focus on researching the MENA region. And we're extremely lucky today to be joined by a fantastic panel of experts on Iraqi politics. Firstly, I'm joined on the panel today by Dr. Abbas Kadim, who leads the Iraq Initiative within the Atlantic Council's Middle East programs. He also is a senior foreign policy fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute at John Hopkins and a senior advisor to the UNESCO at Kufa University and formerly held senior government affairs positions at the Iraqi embassy in Washington. He has also published numerous books on Iraq, including the publication Reclaiming Iraq, the 1920 Revolution and the Founding of Modern State. I'm also joined by Michael Pregent, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. He is a senior Middle East analyst, a former adjunct lecturer at the College of, Uni of International Security Affairs and a visiting fellow at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. Pregent is a former intelligence officer with over 28 years of experience working on policy and counter-terrorist issues in the Middle East, North Africa and Southwest Asia. I'm also joined by Ambassador Faisal Istrabadi, a former diplomat who represented Iraq at the United Nations as Ambassador and Deputy Permanent Representative from 2004 to 2007. And in 2004, he was one of the main drafters of the Iraqi Interim Constitution. He's also the founding director of the Indiana University Center for the Study of the Middle East and a member of, Council on for a a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. I'm also joined by Dr. Randa Slim, who is currently the director of the Conflict Resolution and Track 2 Dialogues programs at the Middle East Institute and a non-resident fellow at the John Hopkins University School of Advanced and International Studies Foreign Policy Institute. Slim is also the author of several studies, book chapters and articles on conflict management, post-conflict peace building and Middle Eastern politics. Thank you all so much our panelists for joining us today on behalf of Amenaf and everyone here. Um, so this event should last for about an hour and 15 minutes. Our panelists will speak for around 15 minutes each before I will then direct a number of questions to the panel and the questions will be opened up to the floor. Um, without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Kadim to begin our discussions today. Thank you, Emma, for this kind introduction and thanks to Manaf for organizing this timely and important discussion, uh, especially given the, the, my colleagues and friends who are on the panel, I'm honored to be among them. Um, I would like to start us by talking a little bit about the circumstances that led to the elections and also the elections themselves and where we are right now. Um, and uh, the story of this election is different than the early elections. Uh, we must highlight and also commend the Iraqis for at least uh, holding a, uh, a tradition that is not uh, known in Iraq previously, which is holding regular elections and also maintaining the peaceful transfer of power in all of these elections. Um, all elections in Iraq or elsewhere in the world have disputes and have also um, uh, disagreements and sometimes even more than just disagreements and that is natural but at least Iraq has helped for uh, since 2005 or even uh, before 2004 uh, those elections that started to and referenda that started to be held were done peacefully and done also with full cooperation from the key players. That uh, deserves to be highlighted. And we hope that this time as well, we will see a peaceful transfer of power uh, and work on, on reforming the, um, uh, the system to uh, please the, uh, the, the average voter and also the average uh, observer. Uh, another thing about this election, and as they say everywhere in every election, this is the most election in our country's history. Uh, this, is, this happens also to be the most important election in our country's history because of the fact that um, uh, it's, a, it's a unique election, that it is an early election. It was demanded by protesters that took the streets in 2019, October 2019, and the months following that. And uh, those protests led to the first resignation of an Iraqi government 
um, the government of former Prime Minister Adil Abdel Mahdi. Um, and uh, those uh, protests, uh, in addition to demanding that the government would be uh, would be re uh, would resign, they also demanded uh, serious reforms to the political and economic uh, uh, process in the country. And some of these reforms materialized. Uh, other uh, 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 or some of the demands were were uh, responded to positively. Some demands were not and mostly not because of the uh, weakness of the protest or the lack of interest in the, in the political class, but also I think there were some external circumstances that happened uh, in, uh, in Iraq and around the world that took the oxygen from the, uh, the movement for reform, um, starting with the December 2019 and January 2020, uh, showdown between the United States and Iraq, which diverted the attention from the protests to a more important news. Uh, there is also the COVID-19 pandemic that swept through the world and Iraq was one of the countries that were hard hit. And that also um, put restrictions and limitations on mass movements in the streets because of the need initially before vaccinations and all of that came around for people not to gather uh, uh, without um, uh, putting their own health uh, to risk, uh, even though um, we must say that some of the protests remained uh, despite COVID. But in general, uh, the accomplishments of that were two things. Uh, one of them was the new election law uh, that was uh, used this time. And also the fact that you had, a, again, uh, you broke the idea that in a parliamentary system, a government uh, gets elected or appointed and it has a guaranteed four years. Now, we do not have guaranteed four years for any government uh, that takes place. And that's important for parliamentary systems. In fact, um, to, to know that the government is not uh, comfortable and they need to work extra uh, time to to uh, to to uh, maintain their right and their privilege to be in the government uh, the other uh, aspect of it of course is the fact that there is a new law on this law i think is the reason for all of the uh, what we see right now in the post election disputes um, uh, in the past uh, the um, uh, results of the law uh, or of the of the elections were uh, more uh, dependent on the strength of the list and the political bloc. This time, it is more on the uh, on the strength of the candidate in each district, and that made a big difference. Uh, and that what accounts for the really the surprising uh, results for most of the participants and also the observers. Um, you will see some results that were counterintuitive. For example, the Sadrist movement lost about one third of their uh, votes uh, compared with uh, 2018. Um, uh, yet uh, they got uh, somewhere around 20 seats more in the, in the Council of Representatives more than their 2018 law. Uh, uh, while the, for example, Fatah, which is a, 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 a coalition close to the popular mobilization units, gained more votes, yet they were obliterated in the seat count. Um, there are others who also um, uh, lost on, on different bases, and some who surprises, surprisingly won, and I will go into that in a second, but a little bit more on, on this idea. Uh, why did Sadr gain more, uh, even though they lost in the popular vote, uh, aggregate vo vote that they received compared to 2018, and they handsomely uh, increased their, their parliamentary share? Of course, their win was not a surprise. In 2018, they were also the top seat winners in, in Iraq. Uh, but this time, uh, it happened, in, as I said, in a counterintuitive way, while Fatah lost, uh, even though they gained more votes. The idea here is that Fatah played uh, or entered into the election of the new law using the strategies of the old law, where uh, you go and run four, five, six candidates sometimes in every district, 
and then the votes that uh, or the support that you will get will be uh, divided among those candidates and you ended up with um, uh, a, a um, candidates taking votes from each other and none of them ends up uh, winning uh, the, the um, one of the seats that are allocated for the district. While the Sadras were uh, more strategically savvy, they did uh, um, make a central allocation of their candidates among the, uh, the, the uh, districts, and they allowed uh, only a limited number of candidates to guarantee uh, a, a win with the least possible uh, votes needed. And that is why uh, they were better strategically. It's not that there, as some people, especially on the losing side, say that there was a rigging of the election. Of course, in every election, there will be irregularities, but they are not enough to, uh, to, to uh, really alter the results in the drastic way we have seen. The, um, the, the, what accounts for results is really some people played on a bad strategy uh, on uh, fielding candidates for the districts uh, because they didn't understand how it works between a single candidate or a two, three candidates in the district versus the list um, that would you would receive from the winners and the losers. Um, the other uh, reason why some people did not um, do better, and I, I'm, I'm thinking of someone like, for example, the uh, uh, the, the forces of the state, uh, Sayyid Ammar al-Hakim and former Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi. Uh, a lot of people expected that they would do well, and they should have, but they did not. Uh, and the reason for that is because I think people are putting too much optimis optimism on the fact that Iraqis are voting in an unsectarian way. Uh, yes, since 2019, we started seeing a lot of patriotism uh, talk. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, 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 arguments against sectarianism. We saw a lot of uh, a lot of calls for for national unity, etc. But in fact, our voting is still sectarian for a couple of reasons. One of them is that we we have a uh, our districts are are se uh, segregated on. Uh, geographically on among sects. And there is also, I think, sectarianism uh, is, is playing a great role in the, in the final equation. That's why someone like Sayyid Ammar al-Hakim and Haider al-Abadi, Ammar al-Hakim is not talking about uh, any, uh, he did not run as a Shia Islamist. He did not run as a, uh, a, a, a Shia nationalist. And he did not run as a, uh, a, a secular all the way. So he was in the gray area and people didn't know where to uh, shelf him, where to classify him. And that's why he did not get any, anything. Um, and and the, the other surprise here, in addition to the loss on the gain, is pr uh, former Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki. A lot of people thought that he would not really uh, uh, come up uh, with, with a win like this. And he... Uh, I think that also goes with the underestimation of the importance of Nur al-Maliki in Iraqi politics. Uh, and uh, he was uh, a, 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 um, a political leader who ruled Iraq for two uh, full turns, the only one to do so in the post-2003. Uh, and also in these years, he managed to create a loyalty network and also a, uh, a, a strong political um, machine that would always be relevant, not to mention the fact that his, uh, his, his place in the, in the uh, top tier political process, because as you know, there are two, uh, two uh, ways to count clout in Iraqi politics. One is on how many seats and how many votes you get in the election and in the Council of Representatives. The other one is how strong are you uh, are you in the negotiating process uh, after the elections? Iraqis do not elect a prime minister, a president, or even a ruling party. Iraqis elect negotiators, 329 of them. And those negotiators are falling into blocks and each block would have a party boss or block boss 
they are not even those bosses on the ballot. Most of them don't even run for elections. So you have the first phase, which is to see who uh, gets what kind of strength in the parliament in terms of votes uh, in, the, in the process. But also we should not discount the political clout each leader has. Uh, someone like Ammar Hakim, even if he doesn't get a seat in the parliament, a single seat, he will still be important in the political process, just like uh, Maliki, just like uh, others like Masoud Barzani, etc. Barham Saleh also. So, um, you know, just to wrap up, uh, this is a, a unique election in, in terms of really we are trying for the first time uh, an early election. We are trying the first time a, a new uh, political uh, rule, a fuel, a new law, uh, rules of the game. And also we are trying uh, to see how the uh, 2019 protests and the upheaval that, that, that was taking Iraqi streets uh, is playing out in the uh, way the popular opinion in Iraq uh, has done. There's also and I'm sure that uh, the, uh, my, my colleagues will, will, will talk about it uh, better than I do, is the fact that uh, this is an election with a very low turnout. So we have to be careful in extrapolating the results of the election on the, uh, on, on the general will of the Iraqi people. If we talk about the most optimist uh, numbers, just under 40% uh, turnout, you know, that even is very low, but also if you really make a fair assessment of the turnout, it will be in the low 30s. And that is um, not uh, something to really use to see where the sentiment of the, uh, of the general uh, Iraqi population of 40 million uh, goes. So we need to dig more to see what would satisfy the, uh, the Iraqi population uh, in the next government and what the mandates that they have to put for themselves uh, in the post-election uh, because um, the, uh, and, and, and this is very important because um, if the next government does not realize what would make Iraqi people or the Iraqi population at large satisfied, they will probably have on their hands another movement that will cut their term short by two years or three. I will stop here, look forward to questions and also look forward to uh, listen to the take of, of my colleagues. Thank you so much for that, Abbas. Um, that was really great. We can and I was on time. <laughs> you were. Um, we can now hear from Michael. Well, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be on this panel with, with Ambassador Subadi, Dr. Abbas Khan, and of course, Aranda. This is, uh, I, I look at the elections uh, based on Muqtada al-Sadr, what he's done over the last uh, 16 years. In 2006, Muqtada al-Sadr was against Maliki and he was moved to Maliki's position. 2010, Muqtada al-Sadr was against Maliki and he was moved towards Maliki's position. 2014, he was against Maliki and was moved towards uh, Maliki's position. 2018, he won the election also, right? He, he won the most seats. And we saw what happened. Maliki was able to form this coalition uh, called the Banaa Party and basically bring everybody inside. So I, I'm a little bit of a skeptic on this uh, on this election, and it's because of Muqtada al-Sadr. And uh, we keep waiting for the myth of Muqtada al-Sadr to come into, into being when we've seen all of these examples of who, who he is. He's, he's moved to Iran's position by several people that can influence him. Uh, one of those people is no longer alive, that's Qasem Soleimani, but the other one is Nasrallah. And Nasrallah's uh, Iraq handler, uh, Katharani, has influence on Muqtada al-Sadr also. Uh, Ismail Khani will have influence on him, but again, Muqtada al-Sadr continues to, to disappoint Iraqis. And uh, my cynicism, I think, is tied to, to the majority of Iraqis who look at this election Yes, the Tashreen movement forced an early election, but they don't feel like they won enough seats in this election. They don't feel like they won enough representation. They are the future of Iraq. These are, this is the, the Shia protest movement. This is, these are Iraqis that are saying, halas, enough with the status quo. 
which was so important. Yes, they got the election they wanted in time and space, but they didn't get the results that they wanted. And that's something that Dr. Abbas Kadam points out is the election turnout this time around was lower than 2018. And 2018 was low as well. My biggest concern is what does Nouriel Maliki do? Just like Dr. Abbas Kadam said, you can win 73 seats if you're Muqtad al-Sadr, but for Maliki to have 37 seats is a big deal. He, he grew his seats in the COR. And what does the new Bana Alliance look like? You know, Hadi Al-Amri lost, what, 31 seats? But Hadi Al-Amri will be in Maliki's coalition. Halbusi, it sounds great that the Sunni Alliance party has 37 seats, but Halbusi was part of the Fatah Alliance in 2018. Has he changed that much? And I'll leave that to Ambassador Sabadi and Dr. Baskadam to tell us. Uh, can he be moved into Maliki's uh, new Bana'a alliance? And if you look at that, if you simply bring in Halbusi and you bring in the Fatah party you and the Talibanis, you already have 88 seats to basically rival what Muqtad al-Sadr uh, has now. And then you put those additional pressures on Muqtad al-Sadr to move to move into compliance. And, you know, I'd love to see the Muqtad al-Sadr, Hobusi, Barzani alliance, and then kind of marginalize Nouri al-Maliki, marginalize Hadi al-Amri. And if we see that, we need to recognize that in 2018, that the Fatah Alliance did not win uh, control of the COR through its partnership with the Nouri al-Maliki's state of law party, they would have been an armed resistance outside of government that would have wrecked havoc across Iraq. Now we're seeing that. We're seeing what it looks like with the Fatah Alliance being, uh, you know, losing seats, but still being armed, still having primacy in the in Iraq security apparatus, still having the wasta to push people around inside of Iraq. Uh, one, of the, one of the unfortunate things about Iraqi politics is it may look good on paper, but in practice is where it counts. And, and the Fatah Alliance, the, the Hashid al-Shabi, the ones tied to Iran, I'm not talking about um, the Sistani coalition inside of the Hashid al-Shabi, but I'm talking about Kitab Hezbollah. And we hear, we see writings from, from people in think tanks saying that Kitab Hezbollah is waning, that Asab al Haq are, are different now. Th those are public relations articles, in my opinion. I'm a skeptic. Um, I come at this as a former intelligence officer. And what do groups in power do when they're armed, when they have control of the Ministry of Interior, Interior, when they control the militias, when the militias are more powerful than the government, when the militias can surround the prime minister's residence and demand the release of militia members responsible for killing protesters, responsible for killing reporters, responsible for killing uh, influential leaders in the protest movement with impunity. And, and we have that, we have that now. We have a, 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 a uh, political party, the Fatah Alliance, that is calling this election a, a fraud election. And yeah, we can, we, can, we can make fun of them for saying that. We can say that they're wrong for saying that and that this election has been certified. But they have, they have weapons. <laughs> they have weapons and they have primacy. And they're not worried about Muqtad al-Sadr. They're not worried about Sarai al-Salam. They're not worried about the Iraqi security forces. What's, what, what is so empowering, though, is that Iraqis are against them, that the Iraqis said no to the militias tied to Iran and to their political parties. They said no with their vote or no with their lack of participation in this election. The problem is the militias can say no also. And what happens when the militias say no? And we're just currently in that situation. Um, Muqtad al-Sadr, I, I just don't think he's going to be able to change this time. I would love to see him change, but I need to be moved by facts and moved by actual positions that Muqtad al-Sadr takes and not by the hope narratives uh, that this man, the myth of Muqtad al-Sadr somehow uh, replaces the Muqtad al-Sadr that Iraqis know. Iraqis aren't happy with, with this election outcome. Uh, Iran's not happy, that's great, but Iran's not happy and they have armed militia in the country that are in the government, they're not out of the government, 
and they still control the COR. And I'd ask this question to Dr. Abbas Khaldun and, and, and the ambassador of course, Aranda. Do they have the ability not to certify the election? Do they have the ability to use congressional uh, tools in the COR to stop this election from being implemented? I know that the IHAC has, has certified it. I know the UN has certified it that we have, but do they have a voice? And, and I'll see my time there. I, I just really would like to, to hear from, from, from the ambassador and, and Dr. Abbas and Randa on, on, on these, uh, this, this alarmist analysis that I pretty much laid on top of all of this. I don't believe it's alarmist because I believe it's a, it's actually in place and I, I'd love to have my mind changed. I defer to Ambassador Astarabadi on the law because he is the one who knows this better than me. Uh, I have to admit, I have not looked specifically at this question, uh, but I am under the impression that unlike the American system, which gives Congress the powers that Mr. President talked about, I am not aware, I'll be happy to be corrected, but I am not aware that the Iraqi parliament has those powers. Those powers um, are vested in the judiciary to challenge the results, uh, to the best of my knowledge. And I'm buoyed a little by seeing Dr. Uh, Kalum uh, nodding because uh, it's never come up to my knowledge in since 2005, but that's my impression that there is no legal power. Now, what Mr. Prejean is uh, suggesting is, uh, which I'll talk about as well, is sort of extra constitutional or non or unconstitutional means of preventing uh, the election results from going forward. That, of course, is a different thing. That was my impression. I normally defer to you first because I know if I miss something, uh, I know you know it. So my impression is this because, again, the process goes from the IHEC to the uh, courts for just uh, dealing with the, uh, with the objections and uh, uh, petitions to uh, handle the, the count, et cetera, regularities, then the Supreme Court will certify the elections. The only congressional or uh, 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 Council of Representatives act on the results of the election will be on the first session where they will have to register the largest block. But that does not mean anything to do with the uh, reviewing the election results. The buck stops with the with the uh, Iraqi na uh, National Supreme Court. I think what's interesting here, just to add one more more caveat, is this Maliki's relationship with the Supreme Court, and how the majority of the people inside of that body have been appointed by Maliki, and he has he has a great relationship with them. I just want to throw this wild card out there. It would not surprise me if at the end of this we see Maliki as a strong contender for prime minister. Thank you so much for that very um, thought provoking discussion. And on that note, I think we'll hand over properly to Ambassador Istrabadi. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be uh, with you all and with my colleagues. I uh, thank the uh, uh, Cambridge Middle East and North Africa uh, Forum and uh, to, uh, to uh, Emma as well for directing the invitation to me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I want to uh, talk about two fundamental things, uh, and let me note the time so I don't go over it. Um, uh, the uh, first is that I would also like to talk about the elections, of course. That's partly why we are convened here today. Uh, the uh, fundamental you know, conclusion that I come to is that little has changed uh, in the political landscape for some of the reasons we've heard both from um, uh, uh, Dr. Kavum and uh, Mr. Prejean. Um, the incentives for the political elites uh, remain the same. Um, and uh, the thing I will spend uh, a little bit of time about is the historical reality uh, in the sort of post-2003 dispensation in Iraq, in particular, the post-2005 dispensation, that is to say, once we started having elected governments, um, is that the, there has been, and this was became very clear in 2018, 
uh, or rather it became sort of, it, it reached its, its zenith so far in 2018. And that is the sort of the distance that the parties, the parliamentary parties have placed between themselves and the government. Um, um, and that has to do with the, uh, with the unfortunate uh, uh, constitutional arrangement, which I must say I am responsible for. Uh, I drafted it in the Tal. It was one of my biggest mistakes um, in, in the interim constitution. And unfortunately it was picked up into the permanent constitution, which was, a, which was a total separation of powers between the government and parliament. That was a mistake. We don't truly have a parliamentary system. We have a quasi parliamentary system in Iraq uh, and it has not worked out uh, well. Uh, for years, I've been advocating a reform of that, but I, I see no particular will to change uh, the constitution. And then I want to talk about uh, the second issue I want to touch on is the fundamental issue facing Iraq today, which is simply this. Politics aside, the state of Iraq is economically non-sustainable. Uh, it, it still has a centralized economy that is reliant on public sector employment. Iraq has been borrowing uh, money uh, from international donors just to pay salaries, and this is simply not sustainable. Uh, and that, I think, is the single greatest threat that faces uh, the state of Iraq uh, today. By way of background, I have some statistics that I would like to go into, uh, if you'll forgive me. Uh, but I, uh, the, uh, according to a 2020 UN World Food Program study, nearly 32% of Iraq's population lives in poverty. Now that is a startling statistic because what Iraqis are accustomed to hearing from the political class in Iraq is how wealthy a country Iraq is. And of course, it, it does have one of the largest proven oil reserves uh, you know, certainly in the region is one of the largest oil producers uh, in the world, but it's, or at least potentially, but its economic problems are profound. Um, uh, uh, a lack of investment in infrastructure over the last, you know, 40 some years of its history, you know, more or less since the Iran-Iraq war, there's been no investment in infrastructure in Iraq. 32% of Iraqis, according to the World Food Program, live in poverty. Let's compare that to some of our neighbors. In Turkey, it's 14%. We're more than twice. It's 13.7%. I rounded up to 14. Uh, it's more than twice Turkey's poverty rate. Jordan has, I think it's, I broke down 14%. I think, according to the same report, 2020, it's 14.4%. Um, and, and Jordan is particularly startling because it doesn't even have water. I mean, <laughs> it's effectively no, no resources whatsoever. And here is an oil uh, producing uh, state. In fact, according again to the World Food Program, Iraq ranks 123 out of 189 countries in the Human Development Index. 2.4 million Iraqis, and this is, a two, this is a 2021 number also from the WFP, 2.4 million Iraqis, that's fully 6% of Iraq's population, are, according to the WFP, in acute uh, uh, need of food assistance. Acute need of food assistance. 2.4% um, uh, is 6% of our population. 2.4 million, rather, is 6% of our population. And in Nainawa and the oil-rich uh, province of Kirkuk, it's 8%. And again, these are 2021 numbers. So really, we're talking about the machinations in Baghdad, and we always do. But I can't help, I couldn't help wondering as I was preparing my remarks for today, wondering, you know, well, what do the machinations in Baghdad, or for that matter, Erbil, really have to do with 12.5 million out of 39 or 40 million, 12.5 million Iraqis at the bottom of Iraq society? So now we're going to have the horse trading again about who's the prime minister and who's the president and who's the minister of youth and sports or whatever. One third of our population is living in poverty. And who speaks for them? Now, let me talk about the 2021 elections. Uh, 
in my view, not much has changed. The same parties, more or less, we're still talking about the same people. Ammar al-Hakim, Nuri al-Maliki, uh, Halbusi, I mean, it's the uh, Muqtad al-Sadr, the same people we were talking about in 2018, more or less the same people we talked about in 2014, more or less the same people we talked about in 2010, plus or minus. What's changed? Uh, the various incarnations of the Shia parties since 2005 have been after each set of elections. We had two elections in 2005 and then 2010 and 14, 18, and now to 2021. The same uh, collection of Shia parties, more or less, have been plus or minus 50% of the members of parliament. Uh, one party goes up at one time, a party that no longer exists, the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq, had the plurality of members from the Shia list. Then it became later on Muqtada Sadr, it's Muqtada Sadr again. And for a time it was uh, Nuri al-Maliki state of law coalition, uh, but here we are. So, okay, Sadr did better. Uh, he gained, as Dr. Kalbam noted, 20 seats. Um, and by the way, there is something I, I do want to make a comment about the Sadrs because there was a lot of talk inside the Beltway, especially, uh, and in Iraq and, and Baghdad, about how the uh, single member districts were going to change everything. And the fact of the matter is, I think one of the reasons the Sadrs did so well is they've always run single member districts. They just weren't de jure single member districts. They were de facto because the Sadrus always made sure that their candidates didn't compete with one another, or at least competed with one another as minimally as possible, precisely so that the result that uh, uh, Dr. Calvin pointed out, uh, I think it was with Fadida, didn't obtain. So it was, I mean, the, the political parties in Iraq are a living organism. This is our third or fourth different set of elections laws since 2005. And the parties have done what living organisms do. They have adapted to the environment and come out on top. The numbers between them are different, but the ultimate equation is the same. They're going to have to agree on the next uh, 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 government. So you've got, uh, you know, uh, Halbusi and the KDP now dominates as it has anyway, the Kurdish bloc. Uh, there are a few more independents, uh, so-called, in parliament, unknown how that is going to happen. So the fundamental structure of the politics of Iraq have not changed. What has changed is, as uh, Mr. Prejean uh, pointed out, the militias have su sustained uh, heavy losses in, in parliament, in the seats. But as he suggested, they still have their arms, and those arms are outside the control of the state. With respect there is one thing, if I may correct Mr. Prejean, or not correct exactly, but amend. He said they were inside the government. They are following these militias precisely the same model as Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. They have one foot in the government and one foot outside. And this seems to me to be the, uh, the, the, the sort of Iranian preferred model in the region outside Iran, of course. So, and, and whatever is left of the secular bloc uh, has just been decimated. Um, so, historically what has happened, especially over the last three years, and this is, by the way, something we should keep in mind. We had early elections, there were only early six, there were only six months early. And I would suggest that when the demonstrators went out onto the streets two years ago, they didn't expect that the elections would be delayed two years. They didn't expect after taking a thousand deaths at the hands of almost certainly the militias, and thousands of others wounded on the peaceable demonstrators on the streets of Baghdad and other cities. They didn't expect that they would just be, that, that all of that would result in elections six months early. Um, turnout, as has been noted by other speakers, was extremely low. That's the second turnout, that's the second election in a row where turnout is significantly below 40%. Um, the uh, European Union estimated 30% uh, 30 uh, uh, turnout. The Iraqi government always, in my view, increases the uh, numbers. Now, what I expect to happen is what happened in 2018 again, and that is that the political parties 
I could be wrong about this. Maybe others are right. Maybe Maliki becomes the prime minister again. That's possible. But even if that's true, the other parliamentary parties keep a buffer between them and the government. Remember what happened in 2018 when Adil Abdel Mehdi uh, became prime minister. The Sadr said we give him one year as if they were in opposition, not as if they were among the key players that got Adil Abdel Mehdi uh, the prime ministership. And I suspect that, uh, I'm gonna try to go a little more quickly as I begin to run out of time. I suspect that that is what's going to happen uh, this time uh, again. Um, so there has talked about forming a majority government. That's actually a good idea if it would engender a true opposition in Iraq. I think I'm on safe ground in saying that it won't. He doesn't have the number of seats requisite. Let's remember he has 73 seats, but that's out of 329. You still have to get to 165 to form a government. And the pattern in Iraq has been um, uh, a consensus government where everyone gets their share of the pie. And in my view, it is almost certainly true that we will have another ethno-confessional uh, government, what Toby Dodge has called uh, the, uh, uh, the exclusive elite pact in Iraq, the Muhassasa sectarian government in Iraq. In the meantime, I see a total frustration of the demands of the demonstrators uh, and of the uh, lives lost in uh, the demonstrations since October of 2019. Their demand, remember, was Nuridu Watan. We want a homeland. Uh, a uh, colleague, uh, um, uh, Render Rahim translates Watan into sort of the uh, French patrie or Italian patria. It's difficult to render exactly into English. Um, fair enough. The problem again is that, the, as I have said earlier, the principal problem facing Iraq is an economic one. And what is needed is uh, privatization and uh, weaning the Iraqi public off of uh, public employment, this will cause major economic upheaval to any government that attempts to implement these kinds of reforms. And in any country, uh, uh, this would require the expenditure of tremendous political capital to accomplish. If I'm right that the, gov that the parliamentary parties will again set up a government that is buffered from them, that they will look on as they did with respect to Alawi as a kind of a a government, yes, but we're in opposition, even though we're the ones that voted for you. Um, that is not a formula for effectuating these reforms. Uh, Ali Alawi, the, I guess, outgoing Minister of Finance, tried, uh, but he had no political backing because he can't, because of Iraq's unfortunate political system, constitutional system, he has no political backing in parliament. Uh, the government is not embedded in the political parties or the parliamentary uh, uh, parties. So how do you accomplish these kinds of reforms? I don't think that answer is uh, very uh, obvious. And indeed, you can see as, as oil prices have gone up, as post sort of COVID the, or the post COVID slump, if we are, we're not quite post COVID, but the COVID slump in prices has rebounded pressure on, on the Iraqi political class to in, engage in these reforms uh, will be uh, reduced. What's at stake, it seems to me, um, is, is, is literally the failure of the state of Iraq, not for political reasons necessarily, that if, if you know, Keteris Paribus, as economists say, the state of Iraq can lumber along as it has the last almost 20 years with this sort of inept political system that it has, and, and inept parties and corrupt parties, it can continue to lumber along, many kleptocracies do. The problem is the economic viability of the state. And I mean from al Fal to Zakho, the entire state of Iraq, uh, exempting no part or region of it uh, is at stake. And for me, uh, the entire sort of American, and I guess, since I'm speaking to a, uh, an English uh, 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 policy institute or think tank, perhaps I should say, the 2003, post-2003 Anglo-American enterprise uh, in Iraq, in, in my view, is at risk for failure. And I'm sorry, I went a couple of minutes over my time. I apologize for that. No worries. Thank you so much for that, Ambassador. 
Um, for our closing remarks, we can hand over to Randa now. Thank you. Randa, yep. you're on mute. Good evening uh, to those who are joining us from the UK or from the Middle East. Uh, good afternoon uh, to people in the United States joining this conversation. It's really um, an honor to join the virtual podium with my colleagues here. And I would like to thank Emma and Mena for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to be talking more about how the region has um, looked so far looks at the outcomes of the elections and especially the Iraq's neighbors, particularly Iran, GCC focusing on Saudi Arabia and Turkey, but also try to contextualize it in, a, in, in Iraq's foreign policy, uh, at least the way it has been you know, presented by um, Iraqi policymakers since 2011 and has been implemented on and off since 2011 by successive Iraqi government. Let me start with the latter and then I move to specifics about how the region, at least specific regional countries are looking at the outcomes in terms of how it affects their relations with Iraq and their interest in Iraq. Since 2011, the principal elements of Iraq foreign policy have been to promote its neutrality, pursue a centrist foreign policy and maintain good relations with both the United States and Iran and improve relations with Arab countries and Turkey. I mean, this has remained aspirational ink on paper during Al Maliki's tenure, partly I think because of his own policies and partly because he was viewed, especially in the GCC as very much a, 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 a Tehran uh, you know, proxy in Iraq. The first prime minister, in my opinion, to operationalize the centrist foreign policy was Dr. Haider al-Abadi, who in 2015 embarked on a sustained path of mending relations with Iraq's Arab neighbors. In February 2019, Iraqi President Barham Saleh declared, quote, Iraq is coming back to the neighborhood, end of quote. During his tenure, uh, Prime Minister Qadimi doubled down on a centrist foreign policy. One principal objective of his new Levant initiative was is to bring Iraq into a political, economic, and security alliance with Egypt and Jordan. He intensified the outreach to Saudi Arabia and the UAE, primarily for investment opportunities in order to develop alternative investment lifelines for Iraq so that it's not stuck to one primary trading partner, which is Iran. The Baghdad conference he organized in Baghdad last July was aimed at cementing Iraq's role in the region as a mediator in the intra-regional conflict, especially between Iran and its Arab neighbors. Baghdad hosting four rounds of talks between Iran and Saudi Arabia positions, Iraq as a regional mediator and not as a protagonist in regional conflicts. Now, how far can Iraq sustain this push to position itself as a region's acceptable broker is going to be dependent on two factors. One factor is the country's internal balances of power, especially inside the Shiite political community, which set the tempo for the country's political life and its regional policies. These internal balances of power put a ceiling to how much influence any regional neighbor, be it Iran, Turkey, and or GCC, can have inside Iraq. I would argue that the election and outcome, especially the win by independence Tishrinis, despite the low voter turnout and the loss incurred by the pro-Iran militias send a clear signal. Yet I take, I take uh, Abbas point in terms of 30%, 38% participation uh, is not necessarily a, a good indication of how the why public uh, Iraqi public feels, but yet, in my opinion, this win, especially again by independent Shrinis, despite the low, vote, low voter turnout and the protests starting in 2019, send a clear signal that Ira Iraqis support a regional centrist policies that is not necessarily aligned with the US, with the Iran, or with Iran or with Saudi Arabia, but more something that is, um, you know, centrist in character. The second factor on whether Iraq can pursue this regional mediation role is going to be who is the next prime minister. Now, 
a telling sign is the recent announcement out of Tehran and Saudi Arabia that there will be a halt on the Saudi-Iranian talks, which were being convened in Baghdad until a new Iraqi government is formed. To date, Iraq mediator role has pivoted around Mr. al qadimis own network of contacts with regional officials, which he has developed over the years as director of the Iraqi National Intelligence Service, gaining his interlocutor's trust, especially in GCC countries, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and investing his own time in the process. If Baghdad wants to continue to play the regional mediation role, it needs to develop the institutional expertise to back it up and sustain it. Until it develops this institutional architecture, the regional mediation role will remain personality driven. And so whether Iraq continue down that path will really be, you know, partly affected in a way, not partly and, and in, a, in, a, in, a, in a big way, in my opinion, by who's going to be the next prime minister and the person, you know, the contacts, the know-how, the interest he brings to the roles. Which brings me to the recent elections and how they are viewed by Iraq's neighbors in Iran, GCC, and Turkey. Uh, Mr. Assadr post-election speech in which he stated there should be no weapons outside state control, no interference by outsider parties in the formation of the governments, the days when outsiders would hold veto power over the choice of prime ministers and cabinet ministers are gone, is concerning to Tehran, has been concerning to Tehran. Iranian officials, as we all know, have always tried to manage relation, their relationship with Mr. Assadr carefully. I mean, they have a lot of sway and influence within his network, but I don't think they can control him. Again, because of this internal dynamics, political dynamic, any country that is a ceiling to how much influence it can have. The low turnout, a historical record for Iraq since 2005, is also another source of concern for Tehran. It's a symptom of the wide gap that now exists between Iraqi youth, the majority of whom are Shia, and the post-2003 political system. Part of the motivation of the no vote is a rejection of this political system, which has opened the door wide for Tehran to gain a large footprint in Iraq's political and security affairs. It is because of this that Tehran has so far rejected calls by leaders in the Fatah coalition to resort to military escalation to address what they claim were irregularities in the voting procedure that led to their humiliating loss. Tehran assessment is likely to be that such an escalation will decrease its proxies capital with Iraqis even lower than it already is. Still, the election outcomes were not a total loss for Tehran. The win by the state of low coalition, as well as the higher number of votes that the Fatah coalition secured compared even to the Sadrist, means that whatever coalition government will be put together, despite Sadr's push for a majority government, will safeguard Iran's interest in Iraq. The Tehran, especially the Raisi administration, that is more interested in relations with its Arab neighbors than it, with the West, there is an increased appreciation for Iraq as a mediator between Iran and GCC countries in particular. And they will be looking toward the next prime minister to continue playing this role. And in my opinion, this is one of the reasons why they have not yet placed a veto on Mr. al qadimi coming back as prime minister, because they have appreciated the role he played in paving the ground for the talks with Saudi Arabia. Now, on the other hand, if we look at the CCC country, there were mixed reviews there of the election outcomes. Fatah loss of parliamentary seats was welcome news in Arab capitals. Maliki's surprising gain was disappointing and surprising. And they have yet to make up their mind about what Sadr's mean, uh, what Sadr's win means to Iraq's foreign policy and to Iraq's relation with the GCC. Now, critical to, their con to the continuation of their current rapprochement policy with Iraq will be who is the next prime minister. Mr. al qadimi is their favorite candidate. Part of his success in the last year at playing the regional mediator role is due to Arab leaders, especially in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, wanting to help Mr. al qadimi burnish his credentials with the Iraqis and position himself as a serious contender for the prime minister's post after the elections. The election outcomes guarantee, you know, or, you know, at least the reading right now is that the election outcome give hope that even if Mr. al qadimi would not return to the PM office, his replacement will likely continue Iraq's centrist foreign policy. But still, it depends on the person who's going to succeed him. 
Uh, GCC countries, and particularly Saudi's decision to re-engage diplomatically and economically with Iraq after years of spurning such engagement, despite continuous pressure on them by successive US administration to engage with Iraq, reflects, in my opinion, they're gaining a more nuanced understanding both of Iraqi political dynamics and particularly of internal Shia dynamics and what Iraqi political elites, including Shia, can and cannot do vis-a-vis -vis Iran. They understand that while not all Shia political actors are beholden to Iran, simultaneously none can afford to turn their backs on Iran. There are economic and political geopolitical drivers to their Iraq policies. On the economic front, there are pledges so far of huge investments in the billions in Iraq's power, energy sector, infrastructure. And so far, you know, we have yet to see these projects, you know, basically yield uh, results, partly in my opinion, due to two factors, risk, uh, risk avoidance, on the part of the GCC countries, taking their time to you know, do their due diligence in terms of how to work, who to work with, and Iraqi bureaucracy. Both of these have proven so far obstacles to the implementation of these big investment projects by GCC countries. On the geopolitical front, Iraq is seen both now as an acceptable broker between GCC countries and Iran, and in fact, especially any uh, Iraqi prime minister like Mr. Al-Qadim. But also is Iraq, which is interesting, is a little bit more nuanced in terms of how they look at it, especially in Saudi Arabia and UAE. Iraq is also seen as potentially presenting an alternative political and, e and economic models to Iran's Shia. So part of what drives GCC investment in Iraq is a desire to create a successful economic model in a Shia majority country that presents an alternative governance model to Iran's Shia population. Now for Turkey, and I will end up with an examination of how this country, a major uh, relations with Iraq, a major driver of their Iraq policy is the ongoing cooperation between the two countries in counterterrorism. For Turkey in fighting PKK in Northern Iraq and for Iraq in Turkey's helping uh, uh, them in denying safe havens to Iraqi ISIS leaders in Syria's ungoverned spaces. The joint Turkish-Iraqi operation last month that captured Sami Jassin, an Iraqi national and a senior Islamic State leader who had been hiding out in Northwest Syria, is an example of the close cooperation between the two countries against remnants of the jihadist group. Now the gains by the KDP in both the KRG and Iraq and the loss incurred by the Fatah Alliance are two reassuring signs in Ankara. The thinking in Ankara is that a Sadrist-less government is a much better option to a Maliki come Fatah led government because the latter will lead to a regression in the fight against terrorism and particularly against the PKK. There have been reports in the past that Maliki governments gave the PKK financial support and Hashd al-Shabi also has shown support for this group or parts of the Hashd al-Shabi. Add to that statements by Iran-backed uh, Iraqi militias like Asa'ib Ahl al-Haq, Harakat Hezbollah al-Nujaba, who have vowed to, blo to block any aggressive behavior by Turkey inside Iraqi territories, with the latter threatening to attack the Turkish military if it continues to carry out counter-terrorism uh, operation in northern Iraq. Uh, part of Hashd al-Shabi also warned, uh, warned the Turkish government and military. A perfect scenario for Ankara is a sadrist led government in coalition with the, GTP, with the KDP and Speaker Halbusi's Taqaddum uh, uh, group, excluding the Iran-aligned group, especially Nur al-Maliki. But Turkish officials discount the chances of such a scenario taking shape in light of Iran's objection to sidelining its most trusted allies and keeping them out of the next government. However, at the same time, they expect both Mr. Barzani and Mr. Halbusi to have strong hands in negotiations for the government and to play a stronger role in reining in, you know, uh, political actors like Mr. Al-Maliki and like, uh, you know, Al-Amiri and other members of the Hashd Shabi. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Randa. Um, we're now moving on to the, the Q&A part of the panel tonight. Um, some people have already posted their questions within the Q&A chat. So this is just a reminder for all the um, attendees on the panel that you can put your questions um, into the Q&A box. Um, 
just kind of carrying on from your discussion, Randa, of the kind of external implications of the election. Um, Seda has made his, as all of you have kind of touched on, his um, attitudes on foreign intervention within Iraq um, known, and particularly uh, the US role as well. Um, by January 2021, the number of Iraq American troops in Iraq had already dropped more from more than 5,000 to about 2,500. However, when Iran finally seemed to be achieving this goal, NATO announced it would increase its forces in Iraq from 500 to 4,000 at the request of the Iraqi government. Although the task of these forces is said to be carrying out training and advisory missions, Iran believes the US wants to continue its presence in Iraq under the cover of NATO. How effective could this be? And what can NATO troops practically achieve in terms of countering Iran's influence in Iraq? Who wants to, whoever wants to take this can. Well, if I may jump in, uh, I'm never afraid to jump in uh, uh, first. Um, I, I think one of the, I hope that the American role in Iraq is not to counter Iran in Iraq. It is not because I am an enthusiast for Iran. I am not. Iran has played a particularly malevolent, malevolent role uh, in Iraq, in my view. Uh, but uh, one of the things I feared most under the prior administration in the United States was that Iraq would continue to be a battleground between the United States and uh, Iran. No Iraqi wants this. Uh, I think uh, uh, most Iraqis uh, want a good relationship with, as, as, as Dr. Slim has just said, most Iraqis want a good relationship with the United States, uh, but the United States is kind of uh, a visitor in Iraq. Uh, the United States is always thinking about an exit strategy. Iran has a long-term engagement strategy. Uh, Iraqis want balance between th uh, three more powerful neighbors, Turkey, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, again, as Dr. Slim has said, and to balance between Iran and uh, the United States uh, and the Gulf states. So that is my hope. Uh, we certainly need the United States. We need the United States for training and, uh, and so on. We saw what happened when the United States withdrew in 2011, within three years under the uh, tender mercies of Nouri al-Maliki, ISIL occupied a third of the country. Uh, nobody wants a repeat of that. Um, so um, I'm very much for an engagement by the United States and by NATO. I'm very much in favor of the sort of uh, new uh, strategic framework agreement that was negotiated by the Iraqis and the Americans. I very much want the United States to play a role in Iraq, but, it, but, it, but, it, but the United States under neither Obama nor Trump did the United States have a true Iraq policy. And I think what Iraqis want is not to be sort of a, a contingent of US policy, Ray, Iran. We need an American vision for an Iraq policy, and that's been absent for too long. Does anyone else want to jump in? Um, but we can move on to the next question. So just touching on that danger of ISIL reoccupation. Um, I, 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 I want to jump in if possible. You know, I think the issue of US forces presence is going to be part of the negotiations throughout the formation of the government. And you have, and it all depends how this will, uh, will, will eventually you know, end. Uh, I don't think, I mean, Sadr is not opposed to a US assistance and training mission. In fact, he has been on record saying he wants to continue an assistance and training mission uh, under NATO, whatever. But, uh, but definitely, I mean, the hash, the Al Maliki want to end this foreign presence, you know. And, and so part of the negotiations of the formation of the government, this issue of foreign forces, particularly, you know, US eventually NATO is going to come up and how will this ne be negotiated as part of the package deal is, is I think yet to be determined. Thank you for that. Um, 
So just touching on the danger of ISIL or reoccupation that was mentioned, ISIS attacks have increased in the past month um, and across Iraq. The Islamic State now reduced to terrorist cells across Iraq, um, attacked a small village in Iraq's Day Dayala province. Um, the attacks show a gaping hole in Iraq's ability to handle ISIS as the US's withdrawal of forces put the burden of responsibility on Iraq's army intelligence. What can we expect from Iraq's new government in terms of guaranteeing security across the country? And where do you think that Iraq's security apparatus stand at the moment in terms of capabilities and effectiveness, if we cannot speak so clearly on the former? Can I, can I jump in on this one real quick? Um, I'm gonna use your example. So you had an ISIS attack in this town in Diyala province, and then the militias came in and conducted revenge attacks against the Sunni population in Diyala and the Iraqi security forces were not able to stop it. So that, that example there, you have an ISIS attack, you have a heavy handed reaction by the militias and the government can't control the militias. And that is emblematic of the current lack of security in Iraq and the penetration of the security apparatus by these militias that are inside of government, one foot outside of government, like, like the ambassador said, but they still, are inside of the government. And that's the, they use that role as a, as a way to intimidate the actual security forces. So that example there highlights the ineffectiveness of the Iraqi security forces to go after the militias. And it's always easy to go after ISIS because you can literally call anyone in, this, in the country an ISIS collaborator or an ISIS fighter. The government does it all the time. But that I think is a, is a highlight of the failure of the Iraqi government uh, to date and the American assistance to the Iraqi government to, to have a equal hand in, in its application of threats to Iraqi society. Thank you so much for that. Um, does anyone else want to add anything? Um, we can now move on to questions from the audience. We have a few um, that have already been posted in the chat box, so I can read out the first. Uh, this is a question for all the speakers. Do you believe recent democratic backsliding in the wider MENA region, such as the coup in Sudan, about the power grab by the Tunisian president, um, will have a knock-on effect in Iraq? Uh, I believe that these countries, each one of them basically has a different setting. We cannot... Uh, uh, use one case to measure the others. Um, Iraq uh, has a, a good set tradition on where it is going. Uh, I don't see any circumstance where you will see a coup d'etat or even a uh, one faction in Iraq would uh, rule, rule the country and exclude the others. Uh, so um, it is, I believe the focus on Iraq should not be worrying about the political process, the democratic process, uh, the democratization. Uh, it is really what uh, Ambassador Astarabadi was just highlighting er earlier that needs to be the focus, which is how to put in place a sustainable, credible reform. Uh, that will take this uh, this uh, political process to a credible uh, uh, chance at governance. Uh, our problem is not with the framework. Our problem is really with the implementation of this this legal political framework that that an economic framework that we have. Uh, Iraqis are um, speaking well. They need to really implement what their words are, and they need to. Uh, simply uh, do the, the, the reforms that have um, gone overdue. But I'm not worried that Iraq will have a dictator that will just uh, fire the prime minister and, and, and fire the, the, the cabinet or a, a general that would just execute everybody and arrest the political class. This is not going to happen. Iraq is a completely uh, proof uh, against that. Um, the, the big, biggest enemy of, of, of the Iraqi put, political process is really the corruption, the use of democracy against itself, and also the fact that um, people are so comfortable in, uh, in the zones where they are in right now, they don't feel. That's why 
that the, the protests of 2019 shook the system and you started seeing a race towards, um, uh, towards uh, more reforms. And that's how we got the new law. That's how we got so many other issues uh, gotten done before the, the protests lost their momentum. So, uh, you know, I, I think Iraq is a case by itself. If I just may. Like Iraq could, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, just as I was going to say, just like, you know, we should not use, for example, the case of Afghanistan to create fear that what if the U.S. forces leave, we would have something like Afghanistan. Iraq will not have that. We, we would have been, an, uh, uh, you know, Iraq, you know, Afghanistan would have been a, uh, an imitation of what would happen to Iraq had ISIS succeeded. In fact, ISIS had a great shot at the time, and I don't think anyone would have another shot like that to, uh, to penetrate uh, through the, the Iraqi political system and topple it and you know, just uproot it. But Iraq proved its, its resilience, and, and I don't see any other uh, chance for another group or even for ISIS itself to do this. So on the security, Iraq is not Afghanistan, certainly on the democratic process. Iraq is not Tunisia and it's not Sudan. Sorry, Ambassador, to uh, well, cut Not through. at all, and I know you leave early, so let me, so I have two points that you mentioned in your talk that I would like to amend a bit, and then I want to address this question. And that is, you said that the uh, first time that an Iraqi government resigns after protest you will know exactly what I'm talking about. You are an outstanding historian. When I say the first time in the Republican era, a government resigns after protests. You'll remember, of course, the government of Saleh Jabbar resigned in 19... 19- no, 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 I'm talking about two, uh, post-2003. Yeah, post-2003, yeah. in the Republican era, in fact, since 1958, yeah. as a matter yeah, of fact. Yeah, well, no, with, with the monarchy, not a single government finished its term. Exactly, <laughs> that's right. But, all, but one yeah. fell because of protests. And also they had, uh, you know, elections uh, at least as good as the elections in Chicago at the time. Um, but the point I'd like to make is I agree with Dr. Abbas, that it, uh, Dr. Kavlum, that it is unlikely uh, that there would be a coup. I don't think the state, the armed or security forces are capable of doing a coup if they wanted to. Um, I used to think before that Hadil Amri might, but that was years ago. I'm not sure he can now. I'm more concerned not about an elite coup as you have in Sudan or Tunisia, but in the population fundamentally rejecting the democratic process. I'm not as optimistic uh, ever, but not as optimistic as Dr. Kavam on the issue of the Iraqis, ordinary rank and file Iraqis buy into the democratic process because they keep voting over and over again, granted the last two elections or the last several elections in diminishing numbers, but nothing changes. And this is the fundamental failure of the political class. I mean, we have right now, we have a, an outgoing president who is a, an Iraqi Kurd. We have an outgoing prime minister who's a Shi'i. We have uh, Al-Halbusi, a Sunni, who is the speaker. That's been the model since 2000. Uh, and five. And, and if, when we get a new government, whether it's later this year, early next year, there will be in all probability an Iraqi Kurd as, pri- as president, a Shi'i, whether it's Kalami or someone else as prime minister, and almost certainly Halbusi will still be the speaker. People vote, the blocks change. Um, uh, you know, Ayad Alawi won in, uh, a plurality of seats in 2010, nothing fundamentally changed. And that's been the lesson of repeated election. And this is, I think, the, the, the problem is not an elite coup, but a, 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 a rejection of the system, in my opinion, by the rank and file, which makes them susceptible, by the way, to a demagogue. And I am afraid of that. But, but I mean, if we look at what happened in 2019, as long as you have this group with so much you know power at its uh, under its control meaning the hashtag shabi 
they have become like Hezbollah has become in Lebanon, the protector of the status quo. So people can be disenchanted to the system. People can vote or not, but the status quo will continue to be defended by this block that seems that its interest, its basically existence, you know, is sustained by keeping the system in place. And so the question that I've been asking myself is what do you do with places like Iraq, like Lebanon, where you have this total disconnect between a big portion of the population, a democratic system, election that have not yielded over time the results that people want. On one hand, you have some groups that are still voting according to their ethnic identity, sectarian identity. They can keep giving some legitimacy to the system through the elections. But then you have a majority of the population that's saying this system does not represent me. But this system is protected by a military, by a militia that is going to fight tooth and nail for the preservation of the system as is. So what do you do about that? How you change? So hence, when you talk about reforms have no chance, of course reforms have no chance to take root because, that, because the way the system deals, I mean, the political economy of this current system that supports it and sustains it is totally, and it's anathema to any kind of reforms, you know? And the people who are in charge, politicians and militias are going to, basically you know see any change any reform as contrary to their interest and so what do you do then what's going to be the position of outsiders like the united states and i pose this this question because it's it's a question facing lebanon although it's a different demographics different you know political reality different history but also it applies today to iraq no but you have one big difference between lebanon and iraq uh, I don't, maybe it's a difference without a, a distinction without a difference, I'm not sure, but there is a distinction. And that is, you actually have a worse problem in Lebanon because Hezbollah is unitary. At least it looks unitary to me, at least. In Iraq, the Hashd is cacophonous or potentially cacophonous. So that could be a distinction. And you can imagine a demagogue arising out of one of the different militias, in fact. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's perfectly plausible in Iraq. Like it, it can arise from Hezbollah in the future, you know? I mean, you you're the expert. I, I don't dispute you ever on Lebanon. Yeah, I mean, some people in DC will say, oh, already it's being controlled by Hezbollah, but still we have the facade of Hezbollah being one of many political players. But you can see eventually a scenario where Hezbollah decides it's it, enough is enough, I'm taking over, you know, and, and just take over like with the hashed or with a demagogue from the hashed coming. And so what, 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 what can you do about this? You know, and that's, that's in my opinion, a big issue for both civil society activists, for outsiders, you know, donor countries. And I don't know, it's being discussed as much as it should be to be very honest. Thank you. Um, just moving on, this is another question, but it's specifically for um, Ambassador Shabadi. If there is major privatization and a shrinking public sector, isn't there a risk that there will be an economic shock that will result in a worsening of poverty, like in the former Soviet Union during the 1990s, as well as the rise of new oligarchs? All of that is true. Uh, we have a rise of new oligarchs anyway in the post-2003 political class which has, by virtue of Iraq having turned itself into a kleptocracy, has not made the distinction between the political oligarchs and the economic oligarchs. It's one big, one big happy family, so to speak. Uh, yes, absolutely. Of course, there'll be shocks. That's why I'm. That's why I have said, and it has to be managed carefully to make sure that, say, you know, Nouril Maliki doesn't end up owning this or that previously state-owned industry. Of course, absolutely. It has to be done correctly. Um, and, and there are models for, do, you know, Iraq is not the first place. You have all of Eastern Europe that has uh, undergone this to various degrees of success. In some instances, successfully enough that those states were integrated into the European Union. So uh, it's possible to do it within the framework of the rule of law. The problem is not so much how it should be done assuming it's done correctly, but who is going to do it? Um, and that's the issue that I think is the, uh, 
of course your point is well taken, but, but how can it be done? Who has the political clout to say to the, to the public, you're going to have you know, economic hardships, but this is, if you wait five years, 10 years, whatever it is, this is how it'll work out. I don't see anybody, I mean, Ali Alawi tried and he failed. And I don't see anyone succeeding because no one has sort of adopted the, the, the governance of the country to the, uh, for the benefit of the country uh, in the post-2003 dispensation to make these needed economic reforms. So the state keeps sort of trying to emulate the, the model it's lived on since the overthrow of the monarchy in 1958, and it's simply no longer sustainable. And definitely not now with the oil prices the way they are. Forget well, about it. Exactly. And OPEC is supposed to increase production, I think, today. I yeah. don't know if that's been announced yet or not. Yeah, so. yeah on the... Uh, on that note, there is a question from the audience about how will Iraq's plan to eliminate gas by 2022 impact its oil-dependent Iraqi economy? I, mean, I, I, I don't see much of a plan and I don't see much of a possibility of if there were a plan of implementing it. I, I don't know. Um, you know, Father Ch the late Father Chelebi, who was uh, I think oil minister in the early late 50s, early 1960s, before the 2003 war, had a plan for privatizing Iraq's oil uh, infrastructure um, uh, in, in, in anticipation of the 2003 uh, invasion uh, with the oil in the ground is effectively to privatize the economy to get people off the public, um, uh, public payrolls um, and to let the major oil companies take on the um, risk of owning the oil in the ground in an environment in which he foresaw correctly that there would be uh, alternative technologies rising over the foreseeable horizon uh, from his perspective in 2002. None of that was done. And every time someone talks about privatization, it causes a huge kerfuffle in Iraq because of the sort of a notion of um, of, uh, uh, you know, the Westerners are trying to steal our oil as if, as if they needed it. But in any event, I, there is no such plan. The last plan for Iraq in a sort of post-oil world was, came to a screeching halt on the 14th of July, 1958. The idea at the time during the monarchy was that the, the, the state of Iraq over the foreseeable future would use the oil revenues to build a commercially viable international agricultural sector. That ship has sailed. You can't invest enough in Iraq to make it profitable now. So I, you know, I'm not an economist. I'm not an expert on oil. Uh, I am, uh, uh, in the words of the late Senator Sam Irvin, I'm just a country lawyer but it looks to me like the problem is intractable uh, and it requires someone with genuine political legitimacy uh, to make the needed reforms and to wean Iraq off this, uh, uh, off the cycle that it's been on. How you do it, I have no idea. And I don't think there is uh, leadership to make that case right now. And given this mistrust between the people and this, you know, political and business elites, I don't see them being able to succeed in making the case, especially when this entail hardships. And as long as this oil uh, you know, wave continues, I think the problem will continue to be postponed and postponed and postponed. And eventually they're going, Iraq, like many oil producing countries have to face the harsh reality when you know, oil prices drop and we move and the rest of the world move into the renewable energy sectors. And so the question is, there are others maybe like GCC countries that have the resources to start paving their way into it. But even there, I don't think they, you know, they have plans, but I think there will, there will be, they will need time to put these plans into place and the kind of leadership that is necessary to put these plans in place. But Iraq definitely is the least position, is the least how to say well positioned country of all the all the producing countries to really face the inevitable inevitable uh, uh, shock in terms of uh, you know the world moving away from fossil fuels and from oil unfortunately we look more like venezuela than some of the gulf states that are preparing 
for a post hydrocarbon future. Thank you. Um, just moving on to our last question now. Sadir has previously made comments such as moving forward, the government and the parties will not control the money and the resources for they belong to the people. How far can and will his anti-establishment and anti-corruption politics follow him into governance? That's a Michael question. <laughs> I, I remain skeptical. Uh, every time Muqtada Sadr has brought up these types of issues, he's been paid off. He's been paid off by the Saudis in the past. He's been paid off by Tehran. And he goes away and he's quiet. Uh, I'm willing to change my mind when I actually see him follow through on something. I, I just don't think he's going to be able to form government. I think once again, he'll likely be the opposition party. Again, he doesn't want to be responsible for what goes wrong in Iraq if he actually is part of the ruling coalition. He, always, he likes the position of being the party of no. And we know that very well here in America. Our political parties love being the opposition parties. Uh, once they're in charge, they, they, you know, they don't do very well. And Muqtada al-Sadr has not uh, shown the technical expertise, the movement, the, the, the party. And I just, I just don't think his rhetoric uh, can be implemented. I don't know, what do you think, Rhonda? And his track record on fighting corruption is like not, pretty dismal, you know? I mean, if you look at <laughs> 2003, every ministry that the Sadrists were in control of is one of the most corrupt, if not the most corrupt ministry and wasteful ministry of public funds in, in, in the and government. Dangerous. So, and dangerous. Yeah. Look at Zamili. Zamili, anything Zamili touches is corrupt. Yeah. Is, I mean, turns out to be violent is against the Iraqi people. And he's one of uh, Muqtada al-Sadr's uh, highest, yeah, one of the highest uh, yeah. members of, of that organization. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't have any faith in Muqtada al-Sadr. I mean, nobody, I don't think anybody in Iraq, except maybe the Sadrists, and that's a large block, but everybody else does. I mean, Faisal, you tell me, nobody believes the stoke of Sadr becoming an anti-corruption crusader. Come on, you know, I mean, it's, 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 just, it's just talk and uh, it might sell to its constituents, but I think the majority of Iraqis who are not his constituents, uh, and there are a lot as the low voter turnout shows, uh, are not going to buy into it. The question is what they're going to do about it, you know, in the future. I, by the way, I, I think you're absolutely right. No one buys it um, and no one pays that much attention. He gets votes because he's his father's son. Yes. Uh, I mean, the sectarian reasons that uh, Abbas mentioned, I'm sorry, he's no longer with us, but uh, that and uh, he is the late Grand Ayatollah uh, uh, Muhammad Sadiq al-Sadr's son. So he gets votes. Um, no, no one's voting for him because of his platform. So, uh, by the way, he has in the parliamentary party, he has some very sophisticated folks. Um, but you never know what's going to come out of Muqtada Sadr's mouth. Uh, so he doesn't listen. Um, but he has, I mean, the people, it's not Muqtada Sadr who figured out this business about drawing neighborhoods and making sure to the extent possible that Sadr's candidates don't compete with one another. They've been doing that since the first elections they participated in. He didn't figure that out. He's got people who figured that out for him, but he doesn't listen to them as the problem. Well, that's one of the very many problems. But also, uh, I mean, there are now some turmoil inside the Sadrist political infrastructure. I mean, look at the different changes, uh, dismissal, uh, repositioning, reappointment of some people, bringing more trusted people into positions, you know, which especially in the political commission of uh, the Sadrist political, uh, the, the movement political commission. So I think there is turmoil. These elections have brought some turmoil as expected, you know, for every winning coalition uh, to happen. So so there is a turmoil going on inside the Sadrist political uh, group, and, uh, and and I think that was going to also impact how he's positioning himself in terms of government formation. Thank you so much um, to all of you today. I think that's all we'll have um, time for. That was a really incredibly informative discussion that I'm sure we could continue for much, much longer. Um, thank you, Randa. 
uh, Mr. Abadi and Michael and Abbas is no longer with us now as he had to drop off earlier. Um, and thank you to our audience for joining us today. Um, just a reminder of some upcoming events we have. Uh, we have a second event on a, in our series on Afghanistan and a book launch event planned later this term. And you can find out more by finding us on our website and social media platforms. And this is also a reminder of MENAF's weekly strategic brief that provides a concise summary of the week's MENA events, as well as projections on what's to come. And you can sign up to receive this on our website. Um, thank you all so much. The recording of this will be made available on MENAF's YouTube. Um, yeah, thank you all so much. Bye. Thank you for having me. Good to see bye. you all. Bye bye.